in all that they teach. You can go prior to these chapters and find the establishment of the heavenly sanctuary that what was given to Moses was a copy. Not only was it a copy, but Moses was told, make sure you build it according to the what? The pattern. The pattern. Don't deviate. You don't have the right to do your own thing here. Make sure you make it as you've been shown. So, how many denominations are out there that teach there's a heavenly sanctuary? One, one, one. Thank you. It's a true question. Thank you. Why? If you look at the different denominations, we're definitely outnumbered. Why are we the only ones that teach there's a heavenly sanctuary and something is actually taking place there? One of the questions I love, I love to ask my evangelical brothers and sisters is, is that is, what's Christ been doing for the last 2,000 years? And, and they just look at it and usually the answer is, well, he's building our mansions. <laughs> 2,000 years, really? <laughs> it took him six days to create the earth, the heavens, and everything that you say. And 2,000, what's he doing? 2,000 years. As Adventists, do you really understand why we still teach the sanctuary doctrine? Why we still teach that something actually took place in 1844? That Christ has not just been building your mansion up there with his carpenter tool belt, but that he has been working as your high priest. Amen. And that as your high priest, he's doing the job of a high priest that you can only find if you go back to the Old Testament. What was the high priest's job? Say it loud. One person, say it loud. You had it right. What's the high priest's job? Okay, he mediated between God and man. And that he had a specific duty one time a year, and that was on the Day of Atonement to do what? And so if that was a pattern of things that are going on in heaven, and Christ is your high priest, then he too is working on the cleansing of the sanctuary. Here's a question for you. This isn't my thought. Where do your sins go? I've asked you this before. Where do your sins go when you actually confess them to God? Jesus. Okay, what happens to them? They just kind of like disappear? No, he's still happy. Are your sins a material thing or an ethereal thing? Ethereal. If you confess, and he is just, if you confess to forgive your sins and make intercession for you, what is he doing? He's making intercession. So what happens? You pray, you confess your sin, it goes to where he's at. It tells us he's our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. So your sins are in the heavenly sanctuary, is that right? Yes. Now in the earthly sanctuary, didn't those sins have to be cleansed? Yes. So listen, on the cross, what did Christ do? On the cross, Christ became your sacrifice. Perfect. Now, the book of Hebrews says that the priest and the high priest has to offer sacrifice. Is that right? Yes. Here's a question for you. What tribe did Jesus come from? Judah. I have not read anywhere that the tribe of Judah were allowed to be priests. Yeah. So, with that in mind, how did Jesus get to be your priest? Order my there you go. Right? Through the order of Melchizedek. Turn back with me to Hebrews. Now you're going to skip to Hebrews chapter 7. Verse 14. Hebrews 7, 14. Say amen when you're there. Amen. Hebrews 7, 14. For it is evident that our Lord arose from where? Of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning what? Priesthood. The priesthood. Okay? And it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest 
who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of what? An endless life. Remember that. This is very important. So I'm going to ask you some questions here. For he testifies. Is that word he uh, capitalized? For he testifies. You are a priest forever according to the order of what? This is Psalm 110, verse 4. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. Old Testament. Who made the promise in the Old Testament? God brought them to Sinai. Did God ever make the promise there for the people? No. The people made the promise to God. That was the problem. The people had no power to keep that promise. And God wanted to show them that. And God allowed time to take place and time to move on to get them to finally see. And God said, listen, there's going to come a day when I will make a new covenant with these people and with all of my people that I will write my laws in their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. That's what he wanted in the first place, right? But because of the hardness of their hearts and because of their unbelief, they weren't able to enter into his rest. How many of you were in Sabbath school class today? What does that word rest mean? When it comes to the gospel, and God said they weren't able to enter my rest, what does that mean? It means that through their unbelief and the hardness of their hearts, that they were trying to save themselves. And if you give me enough time, I will go into that shortly. God says, I will make a people who my laws will be in their hearts, and they will come to me through faith. Amen. Faith. And that I will have a people who will finally, through faith, believe in me, and I will be able to pour out my spirit upon them all. Amen. So let's look. Verse 19 of chapter 7. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope, through which we draw near to God. Can the law make you perfect? No. no. The law just shows you what perfection is, right? Is the law a transcript of God's character? Yes. Is God perfect? Yes. So you know that God will never have another God before Him. God will never bow down to an idol. God will never steal. He'll never lie. He will never murder. He won't break a Sabbath. He won't covet, right? Because that's who God is. And if I love my brothers and my sisters, I won't do that to them either. And if I love my God, I won't do that to Him. So listen. What happened was, and this is why the history of Israel and the history of the Adventist church go hand in hand. That when they claimed and made this promise to God, whatever you say we will do, and they couldn't do it, Pride came in and they wouldn't allow themselves to see nor repent that they broke God's covenant. So what did they do? They took God's law and God's righteousness and God's holiness and they took God's covenant and they reduced it to man-made rules. Chuck, how many rules did you say that they had that they couldn't do? Most of 600. And then they had rules that they had to do. So listen, now you understand, this is brought out so beautifully in the Sabbath class. Jesus said, come to me all who are weary and are heavy laden. If you had to continuously, day by day, make sure you didn't do this, and make sure you did this, no joy, no peace, just weariness. You understand, this is what happened to the Adventist church as well. We took God's covenant and we reduced it down to laws, to do's and don'ts. Patty, do you know this by personal experience? Yes. Does it bother you sometimes? Yes. yes. Don't you want Christ? Don't you want freedom in Christ? Yes. Amen. Saddest thing that I've ever had to do as a pastor is to talk to people who have settled. Talk to people who've left the church and, and, and the ones who've left and then the ones who've settled. They've settled into, well, this is what it is and this is the way it's going to be. I don't want to be one of those people. I want to go from where we're at as the sleeping church of Laodicea that needs the eye cell of Christ to those people who actually get it 
and who have the power of His Holy Spirit working in and through them. That's Amen. what I want for you, and that's what I want for myself. Amen. So listen. This is what the better promises are. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope. That better hope is Jesus Christ, through which we draw near to God. Inasmuch as He was not made priest without an oath. Verse 21. For they have become priests without an oath, but He with an oath, by Him who said to Him, The Lord has sworn and will not relent, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. How did Aaron's sons and his offspring become priests? They were born into it, right? What was the problem with that priesthood? Number one, they were sinful. They couldn't even take care of their own sin. Then they would die, right? But this priest that we have never dies, and he's sinless. <coughs> He is the only one who could actually make atonement for your sin. Now listen, if you lived in Israel, you brought your sacrifice to the priest, they took that sacrifice, they took the blood, and they ministered that blood for your sin. Did that blood cleanse you from your sin? No. Animal blood can never cleanse you from sin. What was it for? It was to show you that one was to come. A perfect sacrifice and he would cleanse you from your sin so you as a participant when that blood was ministered had to have faith that God would do what he said he would do there has never been a difference from old to new in God's covenant and what he wanted there's never been a change in how God saves us it's always been by faith through his grace Amen. That's why we're not dispensationalists. Amen. Amen. This is why we'll never teach that they were saved this way, we're saved this way. Isn't it funny that when you get to heaven, you go back to the old? It's like, God must really be confused if that's the case. Listen, one way. When Adam sinned, God made a promise that through the woman, one would come and that he would and bruise the head of the serpent, and the serpent would bruise his heel. Did they have to have faith in that? Can you imagine how upset Satan must have been that he got them to fall, but he never got them to give up their faith in God? Understand the kind of power that righteousness by faith gives to us. Think about Adam and Eve. In their sinless, perfect state, they fell. In their fallen state, because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, they were able to stay faithful to God through faith in the promise that was to come. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Give me a couple more minutes. Oh, that was the SO. Okay, you're ready to close now? <laughs> All right. The Lord has sworn and not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. What does that word surety mean? Ellen White uses that word a lot. What does that word surety mean, Chuck? Guarantor. What? I can't say that. Can you say it loud? Guarantor. What does that word mean? <laughs> is it the same word as guaranteed as in like God promises nothing can change that he's the one behind the guarantee <sighs> listen how many of you guys own a, a Chevy how many of you guys own a Ford does it come with a guarantee yeah, yeah. how good is that guarantee yeah. <laughs> if God makes you a guarantee can you trust it? Yes. Then why don't we? Has God not given us better promises? Has He not established a better covenant based on better promises and the promises came from Him? He's our surety. He's our surety. He's our guarantee. Would that be a right way to, to say that? He's our guarantor? That's a tough one. That's a tough one. Listen. 
You have to, at some point, read God's Word and read it to understand it. The book of Hebrews is a tough book to understand, but this church has been given so much insight and so much light. There are so many things in our library. There is a whole series by Jack Sequeira on the book of Hebrews. That's what we're using in my class, and it is fantastic. That's there, that's available. Read it. See what God has done. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to, what's that next word? Small word, packed with meaning. He is also able to save to the what? The uttermost. Uttermost. That means that there is nothing that cannot keep you from being saved except your own choice to walk away from it. Again, as Adventists, we don't teach once saved, always saved. And this is where I'll close. I want you to think about this. God created Adam and Eve, and He created them to be able to think and to choose on their own. Is that right? He made them free moral agents to decide for themselves what they will do and what path they will choose. Is that right? So in their perfection, they had freedom of choice. When they fell because of their choice, did God take that choice away from them? So what my Baptist friends keep telling me is that when you come to Christ, He takes away that freedom of choice, and once you're saved, you can never be unsaved. That no matter what you do, now there's, there's a little bit of truth to what they said. And this truth is understanding what it means to be in Christ. Because if you are in Christ, then nothing can snatch you from His hand. Amen? Amen. But the condition is to be in Christ. Amen. But to be in Christ is a choice that's... And now think about this, because this will just give you a headache if you keep thinking about it too much. Faith. Is that something that I make, or is it something that God gives me as a gift? Yeah. So God gives me the gift of faith. But God also gives me the power to choose. And God allows me to choose Him, but He gives me the faith to choose Him. Do you understand God has given you everything you need to be saved? There is no reason for you to ever be lost. But you can choose to not accept that grace. You can choose to not accept that love. You can choose to continue to fight Him. And in the end, He will allow you to have that choice. Listen, in the Adventist church, one of the things that I love from the Adventist church, when I just heard somebody saying, I thought you said you were going to close. Yeah. <laughs> Don't give the preacher a microphone. <laughs> Listen, one of the things I love about coming into the Adventist church is when I was able to study the scriptures and see a much more completed picture of Christ. I came from the Catholic faith. And in the Catholic Church, they teach that, you know, if you don't accept Christ and if you die, you're going to burn eternally, ever in hell. And that really scared me. It scared me. As a Catholic, I knew I did not want to go to hell, so I wanted to go to heaven. Okay? But wanting to go to heaven didn't keep me from doing bad things. But when I found out who God was, and I realized that we were never meant to ever go to hell. God didn't create hell for us because we're sinners. That hell was created for his angels that fell. What I come to learn is that those who will not be in heaven, those who will not have that eternal relationship with Jesus Christ, would not be happy there 
in the first place. Because of their choices, they have chose to become more like their father, the devil, than like our father, God. You will be who you choose to serve. You will be like that person. You can choose to be like Christ, and he will live his life in you, through you, and with you. Or you will be like the devil. The world's full of them. As I close this morning, I want you to think about what you heard. And I want you to fall in love with Jesus Christ. Because brothers and sisters, it is only as we fall in love with Christ that we can start talking about the more mature things of the Christian walk. And this is what we need as Adventists today. We need to hear the mature things. We need to learn about what it means to put away sin. So what it means to actually trust God to allow Him to change us so that we may be the bride of Christ. That takes faith. That takes maturity. But it also takes a deep abiding love in Christ. Amen. Closing hymn this morning is hymn number 524. <coughs>
Father, we need a cleansing. We need a healing. We need power to overcome our sins. Father, help us. Be with us. Help us to know the surety of your promise. For this we ask and pray in Jesus' name.